Hello AP people, we have a quick video today on chapter 9, we're going to be discussing the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, key ideas after the American Revolution, so post-1783, what are some big ideas that people in this country are focusing on, and one of them is Republican motherhood, and this is a very important term that we will see over and over, not only in this chapter, but in the coming chapters, as well. and what Republican motherhood states is that women were to raise children to be good citizens of the United States, so women were expected to be home, good mothers to raise their children to be able to be good productive members of society. Another big idea that we see in Virginia and also adopted in many other states in some form is this idea of religious freedom. And the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom was created by Thomas Jefferson. It promoted religious freedom, believe it or not. And this influences the Bill of Rights when we get to the Constitution. Here is Thomas Jefferson's grave. And on it, it says, Here was survived Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Ind American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. He felt those were the three biggest accomplishments in his life. And notice he also died on July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day after the Declaration of Independence. History trivia question, another president died on July 4th, 1826. That was John Adams. They died the same day, hours apart. All right, popular sovereignty. We're going to see this a lot leading up to the Civil War. It is the idea that people are the source of power and have a say in government. As we get closer to the Civil War, popular sovereignty is going to be used to determine whether a state will be a free state or a slave state out west. All right, the first governing document of the United States was not the Constitution, it was the Articles of Confederation. And the big thing you need to know about the Articles of Confederation is that it lacked a strong central government. There was, it was done on purpose. A lot of the power rested with the states. A huge problem with this, with the Articles, was that in order to amend them or to change the Articles of Confederation, all 13 states had to approve it. So if you have 12 states that are on board with changing the articles and one state says, nope, we don't want to do it, it's not happening. You need to know negatives and positives of the, of the articles, and there's a lot more negatives than there are positives. And the first one is there's no executive branch. And we can think this guy right here, King George III. Why are we thinking King George III? Well, a lot of people were very weary of one person having a lot of power. So when the articles were developed, they purposely did not have an executive branch. Uh, so one person would not have a lot of power. There also was a very weak judicial branch. Why? Because of these things right here, Admiralty Courts. We remember them from colonial America, how much the colonists didn't like them. So they were very weary of courts. So they purposely designed a weak judicial branch. Each state had a single equally powerful vote. In the legislative branch, when they came to creating laws, each state had one equal vote. Uh, small states with very small population were just as powerful as large states. And this led to a lot of conflict between large and small states. Congress could not, I repeat, not enforce its tax collection. It could say to different states, hey, we would like this much money but it could not for why are states weary of giving the federal government the power to tax because of America under the British keep in mind the articles are a reaction against the British rule so you're going to see a lot of opposites from what it was like under colonial America we do have a couple positives uh, the articles did give the government clearly defined powers and one of these was that the government could create post offices you have two very important ordinances land ordinances you need to know First one is the Land Ordinance of 1785, and this divided up land in the Old Northwest, sold the land to raise money. In the old, all this land, the government was selling. Another ordinance is the Northwest Land Ordinance of 1789, and this allows territories to come into the Union. So it is a process of taking all that land that they're selling and allowing those territories to come into the Union and eventually become states. And they also prohibited slavery in the Old Northwest. You need to know both of these. The lands, if you're having trouble remembering which one comes first, L comes before N. And you have to sell land before you can admit them in. All right, some international challenges. America is kind of on its own. Not a lot of countries are liking them during this time. Britain is furious that they lost the Revolutionary War. So they closed the West Indies to trade and they encourage natives to raid colonist towns. We're going to see this happening over and over again up until the War of 1812. Spain, they closed the Mississippi River off to the Americans. And the Mediterranean Sea, we even have some pirates here. These Barbary pirates, they were attacking American ships. And imagine if this guy came up to your ship. I don't know, he's kind of scary. I forget his name, though. That's Captain Jack Sparrow.
Only saw the first one. Okay, France. They demanded repayment of loans, aid that they sent during the American Revolution, restricted the West Indies trade as well. So we have Shays' Rebellion, and it is so, so, so important to know. I cannot tell you enough how often a question comes up about Daniel Shays. He is a former military man. He leads a rebellion made up of poor farmers. Hmm, where have we seen that before? Bacon's Rebellion, anybody? Is his complaint. He wanted lower taxes, and he also was upset about banks that were foreclosed closing on homes. So he leads a group of people and he goes on this giant rebellion. Eventually the rebellion was crushed, but a huge problem that the United States encounters is that there is no strong central government under the Articles of Confederation and it did not have a strong national military and it really made it difficult to crush Shays' Rebellion in the beginning. So the impact of this, the significance of this, what you must know about Shays' Rebellion is that it showed America that they needed a strong central government. And so what do we do? We hold a couple conventions. The first one is in Annapolis, led by Alexander Hamilton here, who goes on to uh, be on the $10 bill and is shot and killed by Aaron Burr. Five states show up. It's kind of a joke. Alexander Hamilton kind of saves the day at Annapolis. He gets a promise from all these states that, hey, next year we will meet up again and revise the Articles of Confederation. They meet up the following year in Philadelphia purpose of this, again, is to revise the Articles of Confederation. However, they end up creating a brand new governing document called the Constitution. So they go to lots of key compromises you must know in this, and you need to know them by name. Virginia plan, know it by the Virginia plan, as well as the large state plan. This calls for is that representation in Congress should be based on population. So larger states should get more representatives in Congress. The small states are like, absolutely not. New Jersey's leading the way. They're saying, wait a minute, we don't want to be bullied. We don't want to be outnumbered. So that plan calls for representation in Congress to be equal. Well, along comes Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and this is known as the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise, and he saves the day. This calls for a two-house or a bicameral. Know that name. Bicameral legislature means a two-house legislature. One house is based on population, that is the House of Representatives, and the other house is equal representation per state, and that is the Senate. All right, huge issue with slavery. What is going to happen with slaves? Are they going to count towards population or not? The South wanted them to count towards population. The North didn't. The South did because that's where most of the slaves are. So we have what is known as the three-fifths compromise. 60% of slaves will count towards population in the House of Representatives. Another compromise dealing with slavery is a slave trade compromise, and this says that the slave trade can continue until the end of 1807. So starting this forces slavery to increase by slaves having children. All right, more stuff. We have the Electoral College still in effect till today, and this is actually used to elect the president rather than popular vote. So if you ever see a question about who elects the president, it is not the popular vote. It is the Electoral College. All the people from the states will vote, and the popular vote winner in each state wins the electoral votes. Let's say you're living in Ohio, and let's say you're living right down here in this wonderful city called Cincinnati, and you go and you vote for the president. Well, if or more than 50% of the people in Ohio vote for a certain candidate, that candidate wins all 18 electoral votes. We have something called the Elastic Clause, also known as a necessary and proper. This is stated in the Constitution that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Basically, Congress has the power to do a lot of stuff not mentioned in the Constitution when it comes to making laws. Let's admire this map just a little bit longer. Okay. We have Federalists versus Anti-Federalists. I cannot stress enough how big these terms are. Federalists, those are people that are in favor of a strong central government. These people believe in the value of a strong central government. The one in particular is Alexander Hamilton. Those that oppose a strong federal government, who are, they are called anti-federalists, and they are in favor of a weaker central government with states having more power. They are in favor of the Articles of Confederation. Federalists are in favor of the Constitution. Anti-federalists would be in favor of the Articles of Confederation. And one of famous anti-federalists is Patrick Henry. Eventually, the anti-federalists are going to come along and they will adopt the Constitution. And this is such a popular question, I cannot stress this enough. What makes the anti-federalists jump on board with the Constitution? The federalists promise to add a bill of rights. Finally, in order to help gain support for the Constitution, we have something that is known as the Federalist Papers. It is a pamphlet by three famous individuals, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, 
and John Jay. The three of them write the arguments and will pamphlet helps gather support for the Constitution. That's it for Chapter 9. We will see you uh, soon. Have a good weekend, guys.